whole new world. So I'm going to actually check the deck list now to see if it's playing a whole new world, and it is. So you really need that fishbone quill to help insulate against that whole new world because you want to take advantage of as many cards in your hand as possible, and you're willing to do that at the risk of card disadvantage in order to insulate against your opponent playing a whole new world and making you basically discard those cards anyway and draw a full new seven. You want to be on a high ink, sort of a high ink value, and you want to commit things that are in your hand to board as soon as possible. Yes, that whole new world, like we've seen in previous games, is such a strong card, and it can really disrupt your opponent, in, you, even though you're getting all new, brand new cards, and so trying to get ahead of that and make a plan for how you're going to deal with that whole new world if it does come down. Yeah, and so it does look like our Sapphire Steel player is playing the Mickey package as a way to ramp in the early game. We have that three-cost Mickey, which I'm sure we'll see. And now we see the... The Argus, the Cyclops, this is usually down there to help deal with Flynn's as well as deal with locations. It is a 4-1. Um, so not super impactful in this matchup, but if you are planning on casting a whole new world, you might as well get as many cards out of hand as possible. And if you don't have another, other, another two, turn to play, might as well play it. Yeah, he does have Mr. Smee, but maybe he didn't find him in his opening hand when he altered. Um, so at least he has a character on the board. And back over to Pierre. Pierre has <laughs> um, his answer to Queen's Castle as well. Pegasus does have Evasive as well, so it's there to deal with Diablo. This is very much a Ruby Sapphire deck that has been teched for this expected metagame exactly. And we see a opposing Fishbone Quill hit the field. Both players are trying to quickly ink via the Fishbone Quill in order to play around that uh, whole new world card. Yeah, I love that Pegasus has evasive. Of course, he is a flying steed. And so how could you have a flying horse without evasive? It's just very on theme. So interesting that Pierre is going to be on the draw for the third game as well. Would much more prefer to be on the play. It's particularly impactful when you talk about a whole new world because it vastly dictates how many cards you can utilize before the first whole new world is played, assuming that it is in the original the starting hand of the game. So not ideal, but also this matchup in general, I would say is Ruby Sapphire favored. That being said, it has gotten be much, much, much better for Sapphire Steel in this set. So it's a lot closer than it used to be. The idea of why Ruby Sapphire is favored into Sapphire Steel actually comes down to the fundamental card quality of the deck. And Ruby Sapphire has the highest card quality of any deck in the game. So once you get to those later turns and you are doing things like refilling your hand with a whole new world and both players are on high ink totals, the Ruby Sapphire card quality just off the top of the deck should, in the aggregate, be better than any other deck in the game. In the game. Yeah, it's really interesting when you have a pair up like this. You have Ruby Sapphire, and then you have Steel Sapphire, so that both of them have that ramp going. So does it really come down to it being a showdown between the, or sorry, the, you know, the ruby on one side and then the steel on the other side with the, with the ramp at work. I would say the decks are fundamentally different because of a whole new world. Whole new world is very sort of, it dictates a lot of Sapphire Steel's strategy just fundamentally. Um, so because of that, while they both are Sapphire decks and they both are ramp decks, their core game plans are somewhat different. Until you get to the late game, both decks utilize the Hiram Drop Package as well as the Tomatoa and utilize Lucky Dime as the end game win conditions. But the big thing that Ruby has, Ruby has access to that Madame Medusa to hit opposing Hero Flower Shams, as well as has access to be prepared to clear large board states. So one thing that Sapphire Steel does well is it insulates itself against damage-based removal because of things like Cogsworth. Well, Be Prepared doesn't care too much about Cogsworth. Uh, both players are looking to get out an early Lucky Dime. Luck, early Lucky Dimes are particularly impactful in any sort of ramp uh, ramp mirror. We do see Whole New World in the hand for Steven here. We have to wonder if it will be used this turn via being sung by that Tinkerbell. Yeah, and we did see a, a, a be prepared in Pierre's hand as well, and he ha is almost up to, uh, yeah, he has seven ink. Uh, is that something that he, knowing that whole new world is coming, is he going to look at playing that to clear Steven's board before a whole new world can be played? 1,000%, because you would prefer that whole new world ah, be, it. So <laughs> you yeah. would prefer that your opponent <laughs> pays five ink for a whole new world rather than sings it, uh, yes. sing it. It's, it's, it's a huge difference, actually. I Playing it and um, spending ink to play it is much, much, much worse than singing it. Yes. So we got a Madame Medusa, Maleficent over there in Pierre's hand. I didn't see it. Steven has a let it go. 
So one thing that's it's it's interesting because there's always this mini game going on where you need to actually prioritize your draw engine. Hiram is very impactful, but you also need to mitigate the whole new worlds, and you don't want to get too far ahead on card advantage because it can all be for naught once the whole new world is cast. But if you think your opponent potentially doesn't have the whole new world, you do need to uh, accrue card advantage, actually beat them via the Flaversham draw engine. We do see another whole new world in hand for Steven, though, so has gone runner runner on those whole new worlds, I believe. Yeah, and we haven't seen a Flaversham uh, yet from either player, but Pierre Marc does have one in hand, so hopefully he can get that down because that I feel like that's going to be really key for him. Mm, it's actually less impactful in this matchup than it is in all the other matches because of a whole new because world. Because of a whole new world. Yeah, <laughs> but it's still non-zero, right? That's the sub-game you're playing. If your opponent doesn't have the whole new world, it's extremely impactful. But if they do, as soon as you play your Flaversham, you draw those two new cards, they're going to go to their turn, utilize those two Fishbone Quills, dump their hand, uh, sing a whole new world, and then you're in a pretty bad spot because basically you expended the tempo of playing your turn, you expended your ink, and you expended your cards in a way that was somewhat for nothing. Yeah. So instead of letting your heart decide, you're letting your opponent decide what's going to happen there with playing that whole new world. <laughs> yeah, I think that Pierre would really like to have a be prepared for this board state um, to stop Steven from being able to sing the whole new world. Like I said, if Steven ever goes to, like, goes to his turn and has to spend five ink in order to play a whole new world, that's a pretty good exchange for Pierre. That being said, the Cogsworth does have war, so it's going to exist as a, as a way to go ahead and sing that whole new world. We have double Fishbone Quill as well, so at this point, Steven's board is set up in a way where Steven can get more value out of his hand than Pierre can, sort of, in general. Yeah, and like we said, that ward is really hard to get around, which Cogsworth does have, and there's not, I mean, he has to be prepared but he in his deck, but the one that he had in hand, unfortunately, went into his discard. And just like we talked ah, about, we see... Another whole new world. Yep, we see Steven <laughs> dump his hand and go ahead and sing a whole new world, which is about as good as it gets. Steven was left with zero cards in hand at the end of that. You actually cannot ask for a better exchange. And now Steven has all of that ink to work with, so has the full new hand of seven, plus all of that ink. And we do see the four for here. Now we're going to see the combo-esque part of this game, uh, this deck sometimes with four popsicles and four Florida spheres. It can absolutely just turbo through its deck. We see the lucky, lucky dime. That's dime a critical piece. Yeah. yeah, I think that Steven is up to 12 ink already, which is pretty incredible. Pierre Marc has a lot on his side, but Steven definitely ahead as far as resources go. Steven, yeah, Steven ahead in pretty much every single way right now and is very, very advantaged to win this game. After the last two turn cycles, it was really that pivot into utilizing a whole new world uh, as well as you can. Also making Pierre discard that be prepared and being able to sing that whole new world with yeah. Cogsworth. And Dow just has so much ink as well as the sort of item suite to take advantage of it. Is this going to be our be prepared moment from Pierre Marc? Um, potentially. So it's possible because if you're thinking about another whole new world, also, you, I think the biggest question you're asking yourself is, are you singing Be Prepared with the Maleficent or are you actually spending resources to, um, to play it out? And there is a Flaversham in hand, so I wouldn't be surprised to see it sung and then the Flaversham deployed behind that to draw two additional cards. Looks like we're going to start it off with the developer brain. We want more information before we do that. We see another Flaversham and a Madame Medusa. Yeah, what's interesting it, with the Sapphire Ruby deck is in a lot of uh, other Ruby decks, like the Ruby Amethyst, you don't have a character that can sing Be Prepared, but because of the ramp with Sapphire, you can get that Maleficent out, and it allows you to sing Be Prepared, and then still have all of that ink to be able to play something else on your turn. Yeah, so the, the Tomatoas can always sing Be Prepared, but it's really not what you want to be doing with Tomatoa. Yeah. Tom Tom Tomatoa is there to quest. Yeah, Tomatoa is yep. always there to quest, not only because its quest value is so high, but also it has that recursive ability to go ahead and grab an item um, out of the Banished Zone and put it back into your hand, which is just so much value. Yeah. Also, I don't know. I mean, I, Tomato is a pretty good singer, but yeah. <laughs> Super interested to see Pierre's play here on how we're going to navigate this board state. It looks like we are going to go ahead and drop the, the Hiram now. So th that would tell us that there's going to be no be prepared on this turn. I'm going to go ahead and draw two more cards, which I do think is correct. I think that Steven is actually representing game right now. Um, believe it or not, I know you're like, oh, Steven's at six lore. What do you mean? It's we're a few turns into the game. All Steven needs is to find another Lucky Diamond and Tomatoa, and even finding a Tomatoa by itself, and he can close this game out in one to two turns. Yeah, he has uh, five items on board, so if he is able to find a Tomatoa, that Tomatoa would be questing for six, and then he could Lucky Dive for another six, and that's 12 lore right there just by bringing one character out onto the board. And Pierre just always has it on his mind that um, 
that a whole new world is a possibility here. And it, it's pretty infrequent that these games uh, go to, you know, zero cards in deck anymore. That used to be the case sometimes in some of these mirrors. It's something you should always consider as you progress through the game because the Ruby Sapphire do deck does draw a lot more cards in general than the Sapphire Steel because these Sapphire Teal's heroes are uh, often destroyed by Madame Medusas and things like Brawl. Uh, so something to keep in mind as you progress through the super late game. Yeah. Both players here looking through each other's discards, and of course that's public information, so you can't look through your opponent's discard, um, which I know oftentimes, you know, especially on uh, a day two like this where they have open deck lists, they know how many copies of Whole New World that are in that deck. They know how many copies of Be Prepared are on the other side of the table, so if you can look through the discard uh, to refresh your mind of how many have been played, then you can kind of know what to expect. And there's that Tomato. It's going to bring that Popsicle uh, back to him. Yes, we're going to go ahead and play that Popsicle, and of course we have the ink available for the Lucky Dime. And now we're going to see... Steven, start to close out this game. You're going to see how powerful the Sapphire Steel deck is. Yep, we got the Lucky Dime. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven ink that he's, or seven uh, lore, excuse me, that he's going to get off of that Lucky Dime from Tomatoa. Yep, and Steven is absolutely representing game on the following turn, unless Pierre is able to do something about that. I think Pierre does have a be prepared in hand. He does. Mm -hmm. uh, even with that be prepared, though, and all, oh, with. Steven also has a bell, by the way. So if Steven ever gets close to 15 ink, he will simply win the game with the bell plus lucky dime combination. Far above 10 ink at this point. So really just needs to accrue two more, uh, two more points of lore, and then we'll be able to close out the game quite easily. The question is, is can you do that this turn, or is it going to take two more turns? That's really the big question here. Pierre is definitely very far behind. I know Pierre is at, is at zero lore, so it might look like he's obviously behind, but in these ramp matchups, and especially when you talk about Tamatoas and Lucky Dimes, those those values can change very, very fast. Very so while, while Pierre is uh, quantitatively very behind in regards to lore, if Steven was to stumble, Pierre absolutely could come back in this game and absolutely could end the game in three to four turns. We're playing How Far I'll Go, which, of course, is from Moana. I love that song, and I think it's a really great card. I'm, I'm glad to see it being played in decks. You have a card. You get two cards off the top of your deck, one in your hand and one in your inkwell, which I think is great that you're getting use out of both of those cards. Yep, so the Be Prepared was a must there because yes. the Tomato was mm -hmm. representing game. That being said, if Steven does get two more points of lore, finds a second Lucky Dime, the game will end. The game is almost certainly going to end in the next two turns, two of Steven's turns, that is, because likely we'll be able to get two lore in some way, shape, or form uh, via that Lucky Dime this turn, and of course the Bell will end it um, after that. Yeah, if he plays Bell on this next turn, which he is likely to do unless he has a better option, you know, but Bell is fantastic. Uh, then, yeah, there's with only that Gramatala on board on Pierre Mark's side, there's not much that Pierre's really going to be able to do to stop Steven. Yeah, it is simply just a two turn clock. There is almost nothing that Pierre can do other than try to execute his own game plan because that two turn clock is actually coming from the hand. It is nothing that currently exists on the field on the other, than, <laughs> other than the Lucky Dime, which Pierre can't do anything about because Pierre does not play Judy Hops. Yeah, it does, I don't know if Pierre, Mark, if there's anything really that he has that could banish an item. No. Nope. Yeah, besides Judy Hops and Sapphire, so all the other item removals in Steel. Exactly. There, there exists ways to deal with it, but they are definitely not in, uh, not in Pierre's not deck. In Pierre's deck. What's funny? There's that bell. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's actually not the bell that's going to represent game. It's the other character that quests for one and is a four one because that character will quest plus the lucky dime would be enough. So Pierre actually has to remove both characters. Almost certainly will remove the bell. Almost certainly has the Madame Medusa. Nevertheless, there could just be a two uh, two questing character in the hand, and that would be game for Steven. So Pierre, if I'm Pierre, I think that I have to find a way to win the game on this turn. Even if I remove the board, I have to assume my opponent has a two questing character in hand. So Pierre is faced with the very hard task as a ruby sapphire player it would be less hard if you were a sapphire steel player of trying to win the game from zero lore from zero from, lore. actually from one lore <laughs> from yes from one can he go from one to 20 in one turn uh he had a, a maui and a was it a fishbone quill that he picked up there with develop your brain he just filtering through his deck looking for answers uh what could be his way to make it here is there Anything so he did pull Thomas. If, if, if Pierre had infinite ink, and surely there's a there's an actual value, I still want to do the math right now. Pierre could probably find a way to win. But with this much ink, uh, you there is no way there is no way to win the game on this turn. Yeah, just another Gramatala. He got another Tomatoa in hand. 
but yeah, that's not quite going to be enough. And plus, even if he did get a Tomato, it's he couldn't quest this turn, so it it wouldn't do much. Yes, there is. Uh, there's definitely no way to to do it right uh, right now on this turn. I'm assuming that, and Stephen will have access to something that can be targeted out by that lucky diamond win the game. Yeah, that lucky diamond. I mean, we just saw Stephen pilot this deck so well. Sapphire Steel doing exactly what it was made to do. What's funny is that I don't think that Pierre can actually remove both characters either. Pierre has access to the Sisu, the A-cost single Sisu that will get rid of the bell. But, but not Argus. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, this Argus is representing game. But honestly, it doesn't matter because Steven almost certainly has something in hand that would also represent game. It's just more of a technicality of like, oh, there's clearly, the cl game is clearly represented on board and there's nothing I can do about it. But I can almost guarantee that Steven also has something in hand that would fill a, same, a similar role. It is funny that Argus Argus, the innocuous 4-1, the yes. cluster 1, is going to be the one to <laughs> That's going to be what, what wins Steven the game here. Because uh, if he quests for Argus and then uses that lucky dime, then Steven takes the win. So congratulations to Steven. Uh, of course, Pierre, Mark, and Steven both got invitations to the Continentals. Um, but Steven moving on to top 8, and he gets that golden Mickey. Yep, fantastic display of Sapphire Steel versus Ruby Sapphire. An age-old matchup of the two best ramp decks in the format. And and you really can see how Sapphire Steel has started to increase its equity into that matchup. Ruby Sapphire was previously seen as a almost unwinnable matchup, if not a, just a very, very bad matchup. And I think it's it's a lot closer nowadays, and that was a great showing by Sapphire Steel. Absolutely. Well, uh, congratulations again to Steven. Um, before we move on, as I mentioned, we do have a new card to take a look at. Uh, if you're ready, I, I have a magic word that I think I can say that would maybe bring this ma this new card up for us. Are, are you ready for it? Yes. Okay. It's Prestidigitonium. And here we have Merlin's Carpet Bag. So Merlin's Carpet Bag 